Okay, so here we are doing this four-week course in early Buddhism. We're in week three. So who has come to every one so far? Ah, excellent. The creme de la creme of the Buddhist library community. Very good. Who came last week? Who came this week and this week only? <laughs> How wonderful, right? You've come just in time. This is the exciting bit. Everything else was really boring. So this is where we're at. We started off for Valentine's Day falling in love with early Buddhist texts, all of these things here. And next last week we looked at imagery, so similes and metaphor, allegory, things like that. Tonight we're looking at the people of the early Buddhist texts. Next week we'll be looking at meditation from early Buddhist texts. So, of course, the Buddha was the teacher of gods and humans. So, oops, so when you think about this talk that I'm giving tonight, we're looking at just a fraction of the beings that are mentioned in the early Buddhist texts. Very good. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much. And well, well received with that hint. So I just wanted to kind of give you the overview of the people or the beings that we're not talking about tonight. So we're not talking about the Brahmas, the, the, the divine beings, the Devas, the Devatas, the Devakutas. We're not talking about gods like Mara. We're not talking about the Nagas. We're not talking about the Yakas. Nagas are like um, serpent beings and the Yakas are like kind of like, kind of maybe a little bit like demons, but not really. The Asuras are uh, more like um, the titans, giants. Gandabas, oh, it's very hard to know what that means. There's also tree spirits, water spirits, there's ghosts, there's the hell realm beings, poor beings getting tortured with spears and forced to climb trees of thorns and have molten lead shoved down their throat. And there's also the people doing that, the beings doing that torturing in hell. And then there's the animals. And then, of course, there's the humans. And we have this term, fourfold assembly, uh, or the Chatu Parisa. And so this means the bhikkhus, the monks, people like me, and the bhikkhunias, yes. female monks, nuns. And then there's the lay women. Lay women are like 99% of Buddhism. Wherever you go, it's women who keep Buddhism going. And I think it's probably been that, that way since the very beginning. And yes, just a big shout out to all the lay women who support me and the Sangha and centers like this and do so much. You're amazing. And so that's the fourfold assembly monks, nuns, lay men, lay women. And I just want to be a bit inclusive and to acknowledge that of course at the time of the buddha there were lots of different ideas about gender and there was people who maybe we would call intersex as well and so i just want to acknowledge that although this is a very binary kind of like division that there's a lot more complexity within that and to talk about the kind of social groups that were around at the time of the buddha so we've actually got a huge amount of information about early Buddhist society at the time of the Buddha in ancient India, in the specific area that the Buddha was living in, what's known as the Gangetic Plain, the area around the Ganges River. So there were, of course, as there is today, a caste system, maybe not as rigid as what the caste system became in India, but there was still a division of caste into the priestly caste, the warrior caste or the aristocracy, along with the merchants and also uh, the workers. And there's also other groups who are regarded as outcasts, people who had were outside the realm of the caste system, um, maybe people who lived in very remote places, who lived in the forests or people who lived in 
uh, who were excommunicated, bandits, people who were expelled and things like that. And then there's also the religious uh, groups that were around at the time of the Buddha. So there was the Brahmins and these people who kind of followed the Vedic traditions. They were they are a precursor they were a precursor to i guess what we call hinduism today or um vedanta but not quite the same like different worlds actually i guess it's kind of like thinking about the early christians and then thinking about something like hillsong it's like it's very different kind of not that they're the same in any way but just like there's obviously been some sort of change right because it's been two and a half thousand years same with buddhism so there were the Brahmins and they followed the kind of Vedic traditions. And then there was also the Shramana tradition, the Samana tradition. And these were people who weren't Brahmins and were following different kind of um, spiritual ideas. There was a great variety as well, some of which were very, very wacky, as we'll discover shortly. So, And there's people wearing all sorts of outfits or wearing no outfit, naked ascetics, there's people doing all sorts of weird austerities, tapas, these kind of uh, ascetic practices, like uh, never lying down. You reckon you could do that one, any of you? Go to a meditation retreat, never lie down. You're allowed to sit or lean, but not lie down. I was mentioning it somewhere, I can't remember. You see this still even in India today. There's a man who can, who's been holding his arm up of his head like this for like, 30 years or something, never putting it down. There's all these kind of strange austerities that happen. And lots of different types of religious groups, including what came what came to be known as the Bhikkhu Sangha, the, um, the Buddhist group. There's also the Nagantas, who um, kind of became the Jains, Jain, Jainism is still a religion practice in India and around the world. There's lots of other groups too. And a lot of the dialogues that we have that are recorded in these early Buddhist texts were spoken to either people within the Buddha's religious groups, members of the Bhikkhu Sangha, the Bhikkhuni Sangha, as well as, of course, lay people, but also spoken with or to or about other religious groups, debates. It was a very interesting time where there's a lot of different spirituality going on. People were talking about it. What's the best way to live? What's the, what happens after death? What should a religious person look like, do? And so these were kind of recorded in early Buddhist texts. So we know quite a lot about some of those other religious groups, because they were recorded and maintained for thousands of years by our spiritual friends in these early Buddhist texts. For example, now just go with me here, okay? I'd better share this with the people on the screen, uh, on Zoom. Okay. Okay, so stay with me. This is oh, gone back. This is a um, dog duty as or actually I don't know where this image came from. I just googled dog duty as ascetic, and this is what came up, right? So also, as you'll find out later, since the invention of AI, there's a whole other genre out there of Buddhist art. But we are going to dive in to an early Buddhist text, meet our first people of the night. <laughs> what a way to begin, hey? Oh. I'm going to click on this link. That should take me to Sutta Central. And so this is a text that we find in the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. So it's a little bit long, but it's about the ascetic who behaved like a dog. So you can listen to me or you can strain your eyes and read that thing and close your eyes if you want and we'll have story time. And so it begins with Ewang Mei Sutang, 
Thus have I heard. So this is a text that was recorded by Ananda, the Buddha's disciple and attendant, who remembered these texts. And always these texts open with a little introduction telling us where they were, what's going on. So at this time, the Buddha was staying in the land of the Kalyans, where they have a town named Hali Devasana. Then Punna, the Kalyan, a cow votary or a cow ascetic, someone who does the duty of a cow or an ox, which means the dharma of a cow or an ox, which means they behave like a cow. And the naked ascetic Senia, the dog votary, went to see the Buddha. So here we have two ascetics fitting into the Samana tradition. That's the people who don't belong to the Brahman tradition. And here, the, the dog and a cow <laughs> go to visit the Buddha. It's like one of those jokes. Punna bowed to the Buddha, so there's some respect there, and sat down to one side while Senya exchanged greetings and polite conversation. Before sitting down to one side, curled up like a dog. So this Senya is curled up like a little dog, behaving like a little dog, right? It's not weird at all. And Punna says to the Buddha, Sir, this naked ascetic Senya, the dog votary, does a hard thing. He eats food placed on the ground. For a long time, he's undertaken this observance to behave like a dog. Where will he be reborn in his next life? Dong, dong, dong. Where? Where do you think? And Buddha says, enough, enough. Don't ask me. And then he asks a second time and a third time. And usually in the suttas, the Buddha will just say, look, no. And then if it's a second time and a third time, then he'll answer, right? Because they really want to know. And so he asks the question again. And this repetition of asking the question again is a feature of the early Buddhist text because it was an oral tradition. So they kind of reinforce the meaning. And the Buddha says, well, clearly I'm not getting through to you. When I say enough, let it be. Don't ask me that. Nevertheless, after the third time, I will answer. So here we go. Take someone who develops that dog observance fully and uninterruptedly. They develop a dog's ethics in a, a dog's mentality and a dog's behavior fully and in, uninterruptedly. When their body breaks up after death, they're reborn in the company of dogs. Surprise, surprise, right? We're thinking about causes and behaviors, tendencies, habit patterns of the mind. Isn't it so unsurprising then that they would end up being reincarnated as a dog? Causes, results. But if they have such a view by this precept or observance or fervent austerity, tapas, or brahmachari, spiritual life, may I become one of the gods? Well, this is their wrong view. <laughs> so it's like, even if they have this good intention behind it, they're not just, you know, just deciding to be a dog for the sake of it, but they have this idea that I'm burning off my bad karma or whatever they, they think because I'll get to a godlike state. The Buddha says, this is a wrong view. And an individual with the wrong view is born in one of two places, in hell or an animal realm. So if the dog observant succeeds, it leads to rebirth in the company of dogs. But if it fails, it leads to hell. So the Buddha was pretty hard. And he didn't mince words. Like he wasn't going to tell, he wasn't going to be, a, what do they call it, a Debbie Downer. He wasn't going to rain on their parade without being asked first, what do you think? And then asked the second and third time, and then he told them what he saw. Remember when the Buddha became the Buddha, he saw the reason for beings being born again and again and again, and why beings born in a certain place were born in that place because of the things they did before. So that would be pretty, pretty, pretty difficult to hear if you were really into your dog duties. This is this is what it, 
this is what this is why I told you enough. Let it be. Don't ask. Because poor Senia, the dog ascetic, had burst into tears. Like, wouldn't you? Oh my gosh, I've been behaving like a dog. And the Buddha says, I'm either going to become a dog or go to hell. Right, crying. And Senia says, I'm not crying because of what the Buddha said, but for a long time I've undertaken this observance to behave like a dog. I've just wasted my entire life. And then he says, <clears throat> this Puna, the friend, is a cow votary. <laughs> What's his destination going to be? And of course, the Buddha says, don't ask me that. And again, we have this same story that both of those beings will end up in this way, becoming the thing that they've been acting as. And one of the features that we find in the Buddha's conversations with these other disciples, sorry, these wanderers from other sects, as they're often known, was that he was trying to explain to them karma. He was trying to explain cause and effect over and over again. And he would often like put he put holes in their arguments, you know, and especially with the Naganthas of James. So quite similar to Buddhism in many ways, but this their idea of karma was that any action you do gives a result. Whereas Buddha said karma is only intentional action. And they believed in pain and uh, purification through pain. And the Buddha says, well, if you're doing things that are painful now, you're just going to get painful results. Like that's what's going to be your future, more pain. <laughs> that's the causes and conditions that you're putting in place. And so these were the kind of conversations that were happening at the time of the Buddha. Buddhism wasn't fully formed in the way that it has been for us. When I talk to Buddhists, sometimes I feel a little bored. Most people are on the same page as me. But then I go and I talk to the Buddhist and people who are kind of not, not quite Buddhist, but interested in spirituality, and they ask hard questions. They just don't take things on... Um, uh, they just don't take things as spoken or read. They ask questions. They ask the hard questions. They don't just believe things for the sake of it. So I find that quite stimulating. Not that you're boring people. You're lovely people, my spiritual friends. And the Buddha talked with everyone. He spoke with rulers, the very top class. We have so many conversations with King Pasenadi, or with Queen Madhika, or people like King Bimbisara. Um, we also meet chieftains and warlords, princes, all sorts of people. Merchants, such as Vasaka, who we'll meet in a few moments, I think, and Anathapindika. Uh, we, we meet a whole range of the social class at the time of the Buddha, of uh, people who are working in industries. So we meet farmers, we meet metal workers, goldsmiths, we meet potters, we meet so many people, we learn a lot about Buddhist culture from these um, interactions. Cooks, yeah, and, and that's why when last week I was looking at those similes, you might have noticed that these were like quite down-to-earth similes that people could understand. If you're talking to a bunch of farmers, you talk about farming in a way that is meaningful. You use similes about farming. If you're talking to a potter, you talk about pottery. And it's the same way when I talk to people about the hindrances, you know, I often talk about our phones and talk about the way we use our phones because it's relevant, it's easy. So it's very, very useful to talk to people in the language that they understand, right? We also meet lots of courtesans and sex workers. We meet Amber Pali, who is kind of like married to the country, so to speak. We meet other people like Super Buddha, the leper, we meet bandits, thieves, and criminals. So we meet people from all levels of society. That's why I want you to get excited about these people tonight. I want you to go and find out just how many other people you can meet in the suttas. This is something I've just discovered. Did you know that you can use your QR code in this way? So I can put a QR code up here and you can photograph that and it'll take you, oh no, it'll take you to this index here of names in the suttas. And look, look at all these people. There's Adimuta, the monk. There's, we've got, we've got, 
Alara Kalama, the teacher of the Buddha. Let's keep going. Get really dizzy. Who else have we got here? Look, there's um, some cities and countries. There's Asaji, the monk. Look, there's so many. There's Bahia of the bark cloth. Now, he was interesting. So there's so many people. And for those who remember last week, I said that these books, these are all the proper names, all the names of the people in the text. So again, sorry, we're not going to be able to do them all, is what I'm saying. Many of you will know some of the main disciples of the Buddha, Sariputta, Moggallana. These were like the Buddha's left and right hand um, disciples. Sariputta was described by the Buddha as being like a mother. Yes, who cared for and grew new monks. And Moggallana was described as like a nurse who cured them. So Sariputta kind of brought these monks up and I think the metaphor is kind of took them to stream entry in the first stage of enlightenment. And then Moggallana got them over the, over the um, edge towards Arahantship full enlightenment. So this is like two important disciples of the Buddha. We have lots of discourses by Sariputta in these early Buddhist texts. And he's a wonderful analytical um, speaker. And he adds something quite different to how the Buddha talks. We're really lucky to have his teachings. And of course, I just want to mention Ananda again. And these are kind of like, oh, actually, I just say when, when, when Sariputta and Moggallana died, the Buddha was still living and they had died. And he said, the Sangha now looks empty to me now that Sariputra and Moggallana have gone. He obviously really cared a lot about these two. And here we have these images, often not here, but in a lot of um, Buddhist countries, you'll see the Buddha, the Buddha Rupa, and next to the Buddha, you'll see a statue of Sariputta, who is usually sitting with his hand on his uh, calf muscle, with his leg tucked back. And Moggallana. Moggallana is often blue or black. And uh, so they're, they're sitting one on either side of the Buddha in a lot of shrines. We'll just have a quick look at these lists and then we'll have a little break and uh, we can come back for more. So one thing I have a problem with today is that especially in the West, we have this fascination with imitating one or two very famous monks from the Buddhist modern period. Like we all have seen those photographs perhaps of Ajahn Mun. Have you seen Ajahn Mun, the Thai forest master? He looks like this. And Ajahn Chah, who's also quite a strict forest master. And in some photos, he can look very strict, but actually, he was actually quite hilarious in life. But if you only look at these old-fashioned photographs, you see these monks looking like this. And of course, you know, the culture of the day was you don't smile. Smiling is such a vulgar thing. And so people think, oh, well, you can't smile, you can't have fun, you can't laugh, you can't be jolly. And we have this idea, oh, I have to be a tough forest monk, I have to be like them, I have to be hardcore. And isn't that rather boring, don't you think? I mean, my experience of people just in this room alone is there's a lot of different people in this room. There's a lot of different people in the Sangha. And we shouldn't try to have this idea of monks or nuns or even lay people being one type of character, right? How boring. And certainly at the time of the Buddha, he didn't try to make everyone the same, didn't ask these people to be like them and and to abandon their personalities he actually praised people's individual qualities and acknowledged their differences. And the Sangha is made up of so many different people. The lay community is made up of so many different people. And he acknowledged their different qualities. And I think it's very beautiful and something we should remember that it makes it takes many, many different people to create a community. And if they're all the same, it would be really dull and boring. But because of the diversity that we have, uh, our societies, our communities can be very rich. And so these, these 
these differences and these different qualities, the things that the Buddha recognized and praised, are found in what we call these lists of the foremost disciples. And there's different lists for the bhikkhunis, there's different lists for the monks, there's a lot more monks than bhikkhunis, although in some different traditions, like in the Cambodian lineage, there's lots and lots of bhikkhunis, but in the tradition that's come down to us in the Pali canon is less. And there's more monks. There's also lay women and lay men. And so I just want to quickly look at a few of these, and then I'll look more in detail after the break. So this is how it goes. So the foremost nun disciples, the most senior is Mahapajabati Gautami, the Buddha's uh, stepmom who raised him. So she was the very first bhikkhuni. So it's like, yeah, she's the first. She's the, the best at being the first. The next one is Kema, who had great wisdom. There's Upalavana. She was the best at psychic powers. Go Upalavana. Patachara, she has memorized the Patimoka and the Vinaya. This is like a stack of books like this. She memorized it. Wonderful, right? She knew the law, the monastic law. Then there's Dhammadina, who can speak well on the Dhamma teachings. And the best at meditation is Nanda. The person with the most energy and drive is Sona. The best uh, female disciple with clairvoyance is Sakula. So you can see there's lots of different qualities that he's praising here. And Bada Kundalakesa, Bada with the curly hair, she was the best and fastest at getting insight. She was the one who saw the most quickly the Dhamma. And Bada Kapila, she was the one who could remember the past lives the best. So these are the Buddha, here's the Buddha's praising all of these different people. And it's the same with the monks. Oh, actually, we don't need to look at oh, we should look at the monks. So for example, Sariputta is the greatest in wisdom. That's who I mentioned before. Sariputta, such a, an analytical mind, a wonderful mind. And Maha Moggallana, the best with psychic power. So similar list, right? There's quite a few pages of monks. So if you go to, oh, look, there's um, Vadya the Dwarf, who has a charming voice. Nice, right? Imagine being Vadya the Dwarf and the Buddha saying, you have the most beautiful voice. One of my favorite stories is because Ananda, yeah, I told you, he's always getting in trouble. He forgot to ask the Buddha to live for a longer time. And so because of that, the Buddha just kind of thought, okay, fine, I'll die. And when the Buddha found out this, uh, when, when Ananda realized this, he cried. He's always crying. I love Ananda. And the Buddha decided, instead of like admonishing him, he said, People love Ananda. When Ananda comes, people are really happy. When when Ananda speaks, they listen, and they don't want him to stop. And Ananda is loved by people. This is how the Buddha kind of praised Ananda. Then there's lay women. So here it's like the Buddha is giving out awards, right? <laughs> um, the best. Donor, the, the most generous person is Visaka. The most learned is Kujutara. The person who best practices metta, love, is Samavati. And here we see, like, you know, some of these women don't even get their own names. They kind of get the name, well, I guess it's still happening in today's society, isn't it? Kind of uh, pass names down patril patrilineum. But anyway, he, he, he knew these people and he knew their qualities like supia cares for the sick and of course it's the same with the men there's lists of men for example anathapindika is the most generous supporter and so we're going to look more closely at some of these disciples after the break so please have a break for 10 minutes come back just after eight o'clock and we'll keep going very good. There's probably some tea and coffee and maybe some food, some nibbles in the kitchen. So go help yourself. 
use the bathroom and come back at just after eight. Hi, could you just give me two seconds? I'm just going to work out how to pause the thing. I've lost the um. Is it this? It's got to stop share for a second. Ah, oh, stop share. Okay, very good. Let's see. Good thing you came up. <laughs> so, did you have a good break? Yes. Who wants to stay a little bit later? A bit. Okay, a bit. Not exactly enthusiastic. So, who can remember? Visaka. What was Visaka foremost in? Generosity. She was foremost in generosity. Here you see Visaka. Or actually, like when you kind of Google any of the women of early Buddhism, you just get the same images <laughs> over and over again. So maybe this is Visaka offering the Buddha some uh, flowers. She was foremost in generosity because she was always giving. And she is famous for another reason. One reason, one reason being that she didn't like naked monks. And when it rains in India, you know, it really rains during the vasa, the monsoon, and it was raining so much. All the all the monks in the early days of the sangha were out there having a nice bath in the rain. And public bathing, of course, is still a feature of Indian society, but they were having a lovely time soaping themselves up, and the sangha was like. A little bit embarrassed she's like you can't have naked monks and so for that reason during the rainy season the three months of the rainy season we have to we, we we have to bathe outside using a rainy season bathing cloth and this was something that the saka offered to the sangha and another time she she insisted to the buddha that she wanted to give eight particular things She's like, can you grant me eight favors? And he's like, look, I'm I'm the Buddha. We don't do favors. Well, look, just hear me out. And she's like, can I offer the sangha these eight different things? And so there are things like robe cloth, food for the bhikkhunis and for the monks, uh, the bhikkhus, and medicine and things like that. Like, nice, right? She's like asking permission. Can I please give these things? She was obviously very generous and wanted to give. And the Buddha's like, why? Why do you want to give this stuff? And she's like, oh, well, you know, people need these things. Monks and nuns, they need these things. And the Buddha was like, what's in it for you? What are you getting out of this? And her answer? When I recall that, I'll be glad. This is Pamuja. That gladness will give rise to joy. And that joy will make me tranquil. So these are stages of meditation that she's describing. We start with the recollection. And for those people who turned up to my meditation class last Thursday, this is what we did, the chaganusati, the recollection of generosity. So this is what she's describing here. When I recall that, I'll be glad. Pretty good, right? And then that gladness gives rise to piti. This is piti here. I'm not sure joy is the best translation. Rapture. And that rapture will make my body feel tranquil, kaya pasadi. When I'm tranquil, I get bliss, sukha. And when I'm blissful, my mind will come into samadhi. In this way, I'll develop the spiritual faculties and the spiritual powers. That's the balas and the, I'm having a mental blank, spiritual faculties. Oh, it's gone. And the bojangas, the faculties of the of the factors of awakening. And it's because of this benefit that I ask for these favors. So what she's describing here is like incredibly high states of meditation and insight into the Buddhist path. And so we have this lay person. And this is recorded in the Vinaya because this is about road cloth and requisites. Um, this, we have this lay person, this lay woman actually describing her spiritual practice in the most profound terms. Like these are deep states of meditation. She has understood the link 
between giving, remembering the giving, and a successively pleasurable states of mind leading to very deep states of meditation and then developing the indriyas, that's the spiritual faculties, the bhalas, the spiritual powers, and the bhojangas, the factors of awakening. So she's on her way. And it's very beautiful to see th this is recorded in these early Buddhist texts. A laywoman describing the very deepest stages of meditation and very most profound insights into the Buddha's path. It's great, yeah? And then we have Bakali. I don't think I got to his page in that list of the terrors, list of the, oh dear, list of the foremost monks. But Bakali, he was foremost in faith, sadha, faith. And here we see him at the end of his life. The Buddha came to visit him at the end of his life and gave him a teaching, tried to rouse him and encourage him. But the beginning of Vakali's experience is quite interesting and I, I'm very aware, sometimes I make light of this um, interaction, but given recent events here in Sydney. So sometimes I say, and I should be more careful, but Vakali was a bit of a stalker and he was obsessed with the Buddha like really obsessed actually he saw the buddha he thought the buddha was beautiful and fell in love with the buddha's form and was wanted to always be close to the buddha near the buddha and i'm not sure if he was queer or if he was just invested in being in the buddha's aura in the buddha's awe but just being close to the buddha thinking that he could get a lot of benefits from, from being close to the Buddha. And eventually the Buddha was like, listen, you've got to pack a lot. And sent him off to the mountains and he practiced up in the mountains for a very long time. Then he got very sick, as we see here. And he sent for the Buddha. And then seeing the Buddha, the Buddha is like, oh, it's good to see you. And Vakali says, it's so good to see you. I've been wanting to see you for such a long time. It's a long time that I've been wanting to gaze upon your form, on your body. And this is what the Buddha says, enough, Bakali, enough. Why would you want to see this rotten body? Like This is an interaction that we have recorded between the Buddha and one of his disciples. It's so intimate. And here's the Buddha speaking so frankly and guiding Vakali. One who sees the teaching sees me. One who sees me sees the teaching. Seeing the teachings, you see me. Seeing me, you see the teachings. This is a beautiful verse. Like, if you can see the Dharma, I'm there with you. If you understand the teachings, you'll see me. If you see me, think about the Dharma, think about the teachings. It's very beautiful. And this really helped Bakali get over his obsession with the Buddha's body, with his obsession with form. And so the Buddha gave him a teaching about form, about how dependent origination works, and Bakali was inspired. And then because he was in so much pain, because he was very, very sick, in the end, he slit his wrist and... In that moment, the story goes, when he was about to die, he attained enlightenment. And there's another beautiful story, which I don't have time to tell you about, how the Buddha said that he had attained full of enlightenment. It's like intense stories, right? So, um... I've already shown you those lists of the terries and terrors the, and the lay people, the upasakas and upasakas. So there's these, those lists of foremost disciples. But if you're interested in really getting to know some of the characters from the time of the Buddha, the disciples of the Buddha, then these two, three bodies of literature are for you. 
The first is the Teragata. This is the verses of the elders. Gata means verses, poems. And the Terra is like an elder monk, or in this case, a fully enlightened monk. And there's 264 poems, and they're beautiful. They're so nice. I pop a couple of copies of the Terra guitar on that table. Please borrow them and you can find out. And then there's the Terry Gata, the nuns' verses, and these are wonderful as well. This is the oldest collection of women's literature in the world. It's great. And then we have the Apadana, which is like a biographical commentary. And the Apadana is the commentary. Remember, I talked about the commentaries. We've got, got the original text. And then later on, there's like these commentaries that kind of help us understand them and explain things. Maybe there was a parallel tradition handing down this bio biographical information. And so we find out information, but sometimes it's slightly dodgy and slightly hagiographical. That means kind of a bit too um, like like uh, positive spin, kind of like um, hagiography. Give me, give me another word. Embellished. Embellished. Thank you very much. Appreciate your help. Yeah, so we can't rely upon them completely. But there's fascinating stories and they're short. And so you can kind of get into them. You learn a lot about this practitioner, their practice and their life. And this is like a living record that we have access to today of the people who are the first generation of the Buddha's disciples. So these are our spiritual friends too. So I thought I'd just kind of go through a few and we'll obviously get to run out of time. Um, my favorite ones. And the first is one we already met, Bhada Kundala Kesa. Kundala Kesa means like, Kesa means hair, head of, hair of the head. Kundala means curly. So she had curly hair. Why did she have curly hair? Well, it's a long story. I'm glad you asked. She was going to get married. But she was attracted to a bad chap, like a bad boy, who's actually a bit of a thief. And in the end, you know, once he kind of got married with her, he thought, now's the time, I'm just going to take, I'm going to lure her to a spot, I'm going to take all her jewels and kill her. Bad guy, right? But she's pretty clever. So she worked out what was going on, and just as he, she, he was about to throw over a cliff, she moved and pushed him off the cliff instead. She dealt with that problem, right? <laughs> Watch out for Bada Kundalakesa. <laughs> but that wasn't this wasn't the end. She was much more fierce. She started wandering. Of course, she couldn't go back to her family because of shame. She started wandering around wearing one cloak, one robe, and went living with these various traditions, this various samana traditions, those ascetics, living these spiritual lives, doing all these crazy practices. And there was communities of women doing that living in the forest, living in ashrams and things like that. Isn't that amazing? Like these were like really alive religious communities. Mm -hmm. And she was a debater. She used to rock up to town, make a little mound of sand, shove a stick in there from a rose apple tree. And that was like her flag, like, come on, let's debate. And she would invite all of like the, the religious leaders of these different groups to come and have try, try it on with her. And she would smash them in debate. And she beat everyone all over the place until she met Venerable Sariputta, that disciple of the Buddha who I've already, already mentioned to you. And so she had a debate with him and she was lost for words. And so she was like, okay, huh. Let me please be your student, be my teacher. And he's like, no, come and meet the Buddha. And she gets made a nun by the Buddha. The Buddha just says, come, Bada. And this is her ordination. It's like one of the first ordinations um, we have a record of. And this is her verse in the Terigata. So 
you see at the top here these breadcrumbs. So here we are in the discourses, that's the Sutta Pitaka. Here we are in the Kudanaka Nikaya, the Maya discourses. This tig means terigata, the terigata. And then we have this chapter, pancha. Pancha means five. So these are the verses that have five. These are the, this is a collection of verses that have five verses each poem. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five. See? This is how they ordered these poems by the number of verses. And remember, at the time of the Buddha, extemporaneous poetry, spontaneous poetry, all different types of poetry, song, verses, different kinds of meters. Poetry was a big deal in an oral culture. And so she here's her verse, proclaiming her enlightenment. My hair mown off, covered in mud. So they used to pull their hair out, these um, Jain ascetics. I think she was a Jain ascetic, a Naganta. I used to wander wearing just one robe. I saw fault wherever there was none and was blind to the actual fault. Leaving my day's meditation on Vulture Peak's mountain, I saw the stainless Buddha at the fore of Sangha. I bent my knee and bowed, and in his presence raised my joined palms. Come, Bada, Ehi Bada, this is her ordination. That was my ordination. I've wandered amongst the Angans, the Magadans, the Vajis, the Kasis, the Kosalans. I've eaten the alms food of the nations free from debt for 50 years. Free from debt means that she doesn't owe anything. She's become an Arahant. So a monk like me, I rely upon alms food from kind people like you. Without you, I don't get to eat. But I'm racking up a debt. My job is to get enlightened so that and it, being an enlightened being, I don't have any debt because I can pay it back fully by helping others attain enlightenment too. And an enlightened being is ahunayo, pahunayo, dakinayo, anjali, karaniyo, worthy of offerings, worthy of hospitality, worthy of gifts, and worthy of anjali, hands in prayer position. So she's been enlightened for 50 years. That's why, if you remember, she was the foremost of the bhikkhunis who realized insight quickly. She very quickly attained enlightenment. And she lived for 50 years. She, oh, he has made so much merit, that lay follower. He's so very wise. He gave the robe to Bada, who's released from all ties. And she's saying here, that person who gave me that robe has made a huge amount of merit, positive goodness in their heart because his offering of a robe helped her get on the path, became enlightened, and now she's a, field, a huge field of merit for many. So these poems are pretty wonderful, right? Like this is like the words of an enlightened woman from two and a half thousand years ago. We're so running out of time. But Patachara is a tragic story that you need to hear. Do any of you know about Patachara? Patachara also means one road. And she also, it's a common theme, married the wrong, married the, or he actually married what others thought was not a suitable match. Because she was from a good family and she married like beneath herself. So she actually ran away with this guy. She eloped. And they got, um, they, they had a, a small baby, a boy. And they lived far away from the family. And of course, in India, like when you're a woman, you go back to your family when you have a child. You go back to your, your maternal family and they care for you and look after you and help raise the baby. Uh, childbirth in India, ancient India, would have been very different to our experience here in our culture. And so she had this baby and eventually she became pregnant again. So she's got a toddler and she's got another baby on the way. And she's like, look, I can't do this. I need to go home to my family. And he's like, I can't go back to your family. They're going to kill me. We eloped, remember? And she's like, look, we need to go. And so 
they start to make this journey. She's pregnant, she's about to give birth, she's got a toddler, and she's got a husband. A storm comes. And of course, in stories, storms are always like portents, right? And so they decide to take shelter. And they, he builds a little like humpy out of leaves and and twigs and sticks and then he goes off to get some firewood in the rain but a snake bites him and he dies and poor Patachara she's there giving birth wondering where her husband is and he doesn't come back she gives birth She's got this baby, she's got this toddler, and the path to her home is across a river, which is swelling up because of the storm. How do you cross a river in a storm, a raging river with a, a newly born baby and a toddler? So she thought, I'll take the baby across the river first and I'll come back to get the toddler. She says, stay here, stay here until I come for you. And so she crosses the river with the baby. She puts the baby on some rocks on the other side. And then she turns around and heads back towards her toddler. But a hawk or an eagle sees the little baby left there on the rocks and swoops down. And Patachara is like, no, no. And the baby is snatched away. She's lost her newborn child. And the toddler on the other side of the river thinks she's saying, come, come. And starts walking into the river and gets swept away. And then she's lost her husband her baby, her toddler. She's distraught. She's heading towards her family home. And because of this storm, there's been lightning strikes and all sorts of things. Along the way, she meets someone coming from that direction. And she says, I'm going this way. And it's like, there's nothing left. A lightning strike burnt down the entire village. Everyone is dead. So she's lost her entire family too. And so, of course, she was distraught, right? You think you've had a hard life. Like, imagine this is like epic tragedy, right? And she comes in front of the Buddha eventually. You see here this image of her wearing one robe, and the Buddha um, gives her a teaching. And in the end, she becomes a nun. She becomes a teacher. Patachara was foremost in Vinaya, a teaching. Can't remember. She had hundreds of students, 500 students she had, and she was amazing. Do you want to hear her verse? We've got time. Yeah, we'll just do it anyway. I mean, she literally lost all of her family. The least we can do is read her verse. So again, this is in the five, chapter of five. And this is very potent. Plowing the field, sowing seeds in the ground, supporting partners and children, young men acquire wealth. I am accomplished in ethics and I do the teacher's bidding. Being neither lazy nor restless, why then do I not achieve quenching? That means enlightenment. Why don't I get enlightenment? I'm working hard here. I'm not lazy. Why haven't I got enlightened? And then, having washed my feet, I took note of the water, seeing that foot washing water flying from high ground to low ground, just this movement. My mind became serene, like a fine thoroughbred steed, then, taking a lamp, I entered my dwelling, inspected the bed, and sat on my cot. We're always supposed to check where we sit. 
so we don't sit on a baby or a child or something like that and kill something. True story, don't have time to go into it. Then, grabbing the pin, I drew out the wick. The, this is a metaphor. The liberation of my heart was like the quenching of the lamp. Remember, the word nibbana means extinguishment. So the image of a lamp going out is the image of nibbana. And it was from this very simple act of noticing change in the movement of the water that she was kind of moved into this state of uh, on her way to enlightenment. And this story is repeated by some of her followers as well. Like we listened to our teacher, we kind of washed our feet and kind of like looked at the water. So there's like generations of um, people inspired by her experience. Do we have time for Amber Pali? Yes. Okay, good. But then we miss out on all the other ones. So again, and I deliberately chose some a lot of the women um, because they're often forgotten about. And Pali is a really interesting story. So she was a very beautiful girl and trigger warning. Like I think this is like borderline, or actually a different culture, different time. She was quite young, but she was regarded as very, very beautiful, very pretty. Everyone fell in love with her. And in ancient India, there was a tradition of um, a courtesan, a sex worker who was highly trained in various arts and poetry and music and dancing. And people, women used to compete for this position which was like the king's dancer or the, the city's dancer, the dancer of the city. It's kind of like the, the courtesan for the whole city. They were kind of, maybe it was like a quasi-religious position where they weren't restricted to one husband. They could have interactions with a whole lot of um, different clients for quite a lot of money. Quite a lot of money. She was very rich. She was so beautiful. She was very, very rich. And she had this title. Uh, I can't remember the name of the title. But she was this, for a period of seven years, they kind of could do this job. And she made a whole heap of money. She was very, 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 very rich. Richer than king. She had a palace that was you know, even better than the king's palace. And she met the Buddha and she offered him a meal and he agreed. And then on the way back, she ran into some Likavian princes who were like, we're going to the Buddha to ask him for a meal tomorrow. She's like, oh, I've already asked him. And he's like, you loose woman, you loose woman, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she went to the Buddha and I was like, no, I've already said yes to Amapali. And then she invited him for this meal and she gave him her entire estate and gave him the mango grove. Her name means mango skin. And in that mango grove, many verses, many important discourses were delivered. So she's an incredibly important figure in Buddhist history. And of course, there's no shame or um, stigma about her occupation. Later on, very importantly, she became a nun and she became an arahant. And her verses about her verses in the Terigata are really lovely. There's something all of us who are aging, that means no one in this room, obviously. My hair was as black as bees, graced with curly tips. Now old, it's become like a hemp bark. The word of the truthful one is confirmed. Truth one's Buddha. Yes. Aging. Buddha's always talking. Aging. Sickness. Death. Over and over again. She's like, yep, I've got the aging. Crowned with flowers, my head was as fragrant as a perfume box. Now old. Smells like dog fur. The word of the truthful one is confirmed. My hair was as thick as a well-planted forest. It shone, parted with the brush and pins, 
Now old, it's patchy and sparse. The Buddha was right. She goes on about her hair. Well, she's had to skip a few or three things here. Um, my teeth used to be so pretty, bright as a jasmine flower. Now old, they're broken and yellow. The word of the truthful one is confirmed. My singing was as sweet as a cuckoo. Cuckoo. Wandering in the forest groves. Now old, it's patchy and croaking. The word of the truthful one is confirmed. She has all these wonderful similes. Um, like, my breasts used to be so pretty. Swelling round, close and high. Now they droop like water bags. Yes, the Buddha was right. And she goes on like this. Kind of, this is a former, a woman who was so beautiful. Her entire personality, her entire life was wrapped up in being the most beautiful woman in the world. And here she's saying, actually, you know what? Things change. You know? Anyway, can't go on about that. Last one, okay? Because we're running out of time. Many of you already know Angulimala. He's quite a well-known figure. Who's heard of, about him? Yeah, most of you, right? I know. You see, AI. I did post this on my Facebook and someone was like, um, and I was like, oh, just Google Angulimala. She's like, yeah, I know. So I think she might have been suggesting that this was a sexy Angulimala. So, yes, he does look quite... Um, powerful here right like there's there's a real kind of fear that i kind of get looking at him with these two knives two knives a dead body and of course if you can see closely this necklace so many of you will know that this word anguli means finger mala means necklace garland so he's called anguli mala because he has a necklace made out of fingers why you might ask i'm glad you asked so angulimala it's not his real name not his original name he was um a student the story goes he was a student of some spiritual teacher who had a lot of jealous students they're all jealous of of angulimala and so they kind of put a lot of pressure on his teacher and then to kind of progress in his teachings this teacher said listen if you want to get to the next, it's a bit like Scientology. If you want to get to the next stage, you have to pay a fee. What's the fee? 1,000 fingers. 1,000 individual fingers. And instead of saying, okay, I can't afford it, he thought, okay, here we go. So would you be willing to part with your finger? You got ten of them, yeah. Oh, oh. Of <laughs> so very not, not surprisingly, many people didn't want to give up their fingers, so he had to resort to killing them instead. And so he became known as this bandit who was traveling around, and that's how he accumulated so many fingers. He had killed nine hundred and ninety nine people. So you know, sometimes these stories are a little bit too perfect, right? And then he saw the Buddha. So. Remember, he was supposed to get 1,000 fingers? And here comes the Buddha. Do you think he's going to get the Buddha's finger? No. What happened? The Buddha entered this grove, entered this forest, even though he'd been warned not to go there by all the locals. Don't go there. There's a bandit, Angulimala. He's going to kill you and take your finger. And the Buddha walks in anyway. And Angulimala Mala sees him and decides to attack him. He tries to attack the Buddha. Oh, here's a good slide. So many famous images, and we see all of these. Actually, this one's not so good now that I look at it. But we see the Buddha sneaking ahead, and magically, every time Angulimala thinks he's close, the Buddha moves ahead. Every time he keeps on following him, the Buddha moves ahead. And he's like, stop! And the Buddha says, I have stopped. You have not stopped. You should stop. And Angulimala thought, what do you mean you haven't stopped to keep on moving? And he's like, well, I've stopped. I am freed from hatred and greed and delusion. 
I will never harm another being. You should stop too. And through the power of metta, through the power of love, Angulimala um, succumbs to this kindness and becomes a student of the Buddha. And then then of course people find out that the Buddha's converted um, Angulimala and, and even the king comes along and it's like uh, yeah. You know, people wanted Angulimala dead. And he comes to the Buddha, the king comes to the Buddha and says, you know, there's this band at Angulimala. And the Buddha says, well, what, what would you do? <laughs> what would you do if I told you that this bandit had become a monk? And then the king's like, well, in that case, I would bow down to him and, you know, offer him requisites. And Buddha's like, well, actually, <laughs> as it turns out. And so Angulimala becomes a monk and starts to lead a spiritual life. He doesn't get away. I mean, he got away with murder. And that's a bit of a kind of like thing. Um, it doesn't mean he escaped karmically. A lot of people pelted him with things like stones and for his entire life as a monk he was hassled and chased and hurt and the buddha said this is your karma from the past catching up with you remember buddhism doesn't punish don't believe in punishment justice sure karma definitely but not punishment and this is something I think we can learn a lot from. Like, anyway, I don't have time. Don't have time. But the Angulimala Parita, as it's known, this protective verse, what happened was one day Angulimala was out walking around and he saw a woman giving birth and she had an obstructed birth. Again, birth in ancient India, right? Not easy. A lot of women up until just recently used to die in childbirth. And this woman was having troubles. And he went back to the Buddha and said, I saw this woman. She was having these terrible difficulties. And by this time, he had become an Arahant. And he said to the, the Buddha said to him, go, go to that woman and tell her a truth that since you have taken noble birth, that's Aryan birth, that means that the Buddha perceived that when Angu Angulimala had become an Arahant, he had essentially been reborn. He had abandoned all his old ways. Because remember, a person, according to the Buddha, is a result of their actions. A good person is a person who does good actions. And a bad person is someone who does bad actions. It's not that they're a bad person, it's that they do bad actions. And... So he'd done this, this good action of becoming an arahant. And so the Buddha says, use this asservation, asservation of truth, which is an important thing in, in Buddhism, that the power of the truth is, is um, something that is almost like a magical thing. Truth is powerful, right? And so he says, tell them that since you've taken noble birth, you have never taken the life of a living creature. By this truth, may both you and your baby be safe. And so this is a chant, like, it's so weird. So it kind of goes like this. We do it for pregnant women. Yatoham bhagini hariyaya jati jato nabhijana misanji japanam jivita voro peta pena satchena soti te ho tu so dighabasa so that's those words. And so now in Buddhist culture today, when we see a pregnant woman or when a, a pregnant woman comes to us, we chant these verses as a protection for them, to help them. And it's like one of the most bizarre plot twists, right? Here's this person associated with 999 grim deaths. 
And yet, through the power of the Buddha's teachings, he became an enlightened being and helped this woman bring new life into the world. It worked. She gave birth successfully. And now we remember him in the name that he used for himself, Ahimsa, harmlessness, not Angulimala, the bandit, the killer, but harmlessness. And this is a beautiful quality that even someone who had murdered almost a thousand beings could develop goodness. And so I don't know what you've done in your life and certainly haven't killed a thousand people, but whatever you've done, it's in the past and you have this rich potential for goodness. And this is something that I really find very inspiring in the Buddhist teachings, that even the worst person can become a beautiful being and give hope and help other beings as well. Be a good spiritual friend. So unfortunately, we have to leave it there. I'm just going to, oh, it's a shame you don't get to find out about, oh, I mean, that one's so good too. So all, all of these um, talks will end up on YouTube. So I just want you to know that you can look up, you could use this little dinosaur thing here to with your phones right now to find out the QR code to access those index of names on Sutta Central or the Tarigata. But next week, we will be back here, same time, and we'll be looking at meditation in the early Buddhist texts. What does meditation in the early Buddhist texts look like? Who knows, right? So that's all for tonight. Thank you for being here. Please borrow a book. Look in the indexes on Sutta Central or Access to Insight. Read the Disciples of the Buddha. Read the Tarigata. Read the Teragata. And find out about these amazing people from the time of the Buddha who just like you were interested in spiritual teachings and just like you made progress on the spiritual path. And so these people, our spiritual friends from the distant past can help you to make further progress on the spiritual path. And learning from them might just be that little piece of information that pushes you all the way to enlightenment. So. May it be so. Thank you for coming tonight. I'll stick around for a bit afterwards and I look forward to seeing you all next week.